Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. All right, we got candy. Yeah, All right. Take one, pass them around, okay? This is enough for both classes. Very high card. Say some for the evening students, please. If you don't know, take your And see if I was smart, I would bought the candy tomorrow because it would have been like one tenth the cost. But I just paid a lot. Seriously, Kroger is like, how much is a little candy usually cost like that? I don't even know. I paid about eight dollars. Is that that normal? Really? I don't ever buy candy. I'm sorry, I didn't go to a dollar store. Got to like, you know, Willy Wonka like brand candy or something. All right. So no costumes? All right, so no costumes today, nothing? No one dressed up? I heard another section actually had a costume contest. What's up with you guys? Why are you so lame? <laughs> You're missing the hat. Ah, an able was a law student. Okay, you're not quite tall enough. I don't. <laughs> okay, you got the beard going. That's okay. Actually, I don't think Lincoln grew a beard till later in his life. You ever see? Uh, you ever seen when he was younger? He didn't have a beard. Yeah, and, and actually, everyone know that Abe Lincoln actually argued for the Supreme Court? He did. He was actually a, at a, the patent case. Abe Lincoln argued for the Supreme Court. Kind of cool. Abe Lincoln argued for the Supreme Court. You got that, everyone? He did. Yes, Alex, he did. Okay. Um, uh, some of you asked, uh, New York is in a... It's pretty bad. My parents, thankfully, are fine. There's no damage to their house, but other places in Staten Island were actually really, really bad. The entire shoreline was just totally swept away. I mean, there were houses that were just washed away by the water that, were, that just that don't exist anymore. They were just dragged into the sea. Um, actually, Seaside Heights, New Jersey, gone. Actually, let me bring these pictures up. Gone. I actually have pictures I'll bring up in a second, but, but gone, gone. Like, like swimming with the fishes, gone. No, it's, it's, it's all fake. Yeah, actually, I have, I have before and after pictures. So that's what it looked like before. Okay? This is after. Karma is actually a couple blocks inland. But it's probably sw flooded. Yes, yes, that's where the look. This is where the boardwalk was. Yeah, it's a, it's a very similar vantage point. Uh, yeah, it seems like you're just scrolling. Yeah, but th that's it. The, the boardwalk was like here. Yeah, it's a Jersey thing. Yeah. Uh, let's not go there. <laughs> no, let's not go there. Nah, no, nah, no. Nah. And actually, it was taken out of context, so let's definitely not go there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so the Jersey Shore is totally messed up. Um, there was actually one restaurant in Staten Island about a, maybe about a mile from where I live that was swept into the ocean. It was actually built on a cliff right by the water, maybe about 50 feet up from the water, and it just whoosh, fell into the ocean. It's just a parking lot now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, so here's our lesson. Let's learn maybe. Oh, None of you got that. Okay. I said it's kind of crazy. So here's our lesson. So let's learn maybe. Oh, God. You didn't even get. All right. Eat some sugar and we'll get it. Uh, but actually, whoever posted that question is actually a fair question. The, uh, th there are definitely certain socioeconomic issues in rebuilding. If you look at the aftermath of 9 11, how much money flooded versus, say, the aftermath of Katrina. Uh, Kanye was onto something, but but not, not in his usual blunt way to exactly say it right. So um, the amount, how do I put it like this? The ability of a city to be resilient and respond to disaster is direct proportion to how wealthy it is before. If you start in a very poor place like New Orleans before, they're not going to do a very good job of splashing. Certain place like New York, there's a lot of money before they can they can do things like you know turn power back on in two or three days, or you know pump out a subway system. 
or, or keep hospitals alive or you know transfer people from different places. Uh, my aunt who lives in a Coney Island uh, or Seagate, which is right by Brooklyn, she has five feet of water in her basement. My mama emailed me before. Uh, he, he, oh, here's a picture. It's flowing now. So see, there was like this huge boardwalk right by the beach. Yeah. So th that's somewhere like here, I suppose. Um, and that's what Seaside looked like before. See, like, kind of the, the boardwalk juts out here into the, in, almost to the water. But actually, the, the roller coaster would have been about right here and right here. And actually, the Jersey Shore house was right here. And this is what it looks like now. Yeah, I mean, it, you can't really tell from the picture, but every single street's flooded, and there's basically sand and debris uh, all over the place. It's really, uh, really. Oh, no. Uh, that's that Snooky's tweet. She said, rest in peace, Seaside. Of course I do. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> like, seriously. OK, so, so yeah, and there are going to be serious, um, uh, in, in, <laughs> serious land use issues going forward because the entire place was destroyed. And um, insurance policies are going to be coming to play, uh, defining where property lines were. Defining what damage was caused by the hurricane and what damage was actually caused by, you know, floods. I mean, insurance law is a really tricky thing. Depending how the damage was caused, you might have different policies. Like, say you have flood insurance, but you don't have the hurricane insurance, you might be out of luck. But if you have, but but say that the flooding was caused after the hurricane left. In other words, you know, there was a hurricane and then waters came because a, a, a levee broke. For example, in Palm River, New Jersey, that might not be hurricane insurance coverage. So there are various ways. Okay. Everyone get candy? Everyone get candy? Okay, I'm gonna save these. Oh, you're coming tonight. I'm gonna save these for the night since later. You want a piece? Yeah, I'm gonna save these for the night since later. I think there's enough for everyone. If there's not, they'll kill me. Is that what? I, I think they, they 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 took it down, but um yeah, there was a crane hanging over New York City. Um it, it's hard to convey how Significant it is when the entire New York City subway system is shut down for days. Um, you know, all of you have cars, but actually, I think Mayor Bloomberg just gave a press conference where he's banning passenger cars into Manhattan for a few days because it's so difficult to get around. Um, even on Staten Island the other day, my mom was driving around, and there were actually traffic jams because everyone wanted to get a glimpse of the destruction. It was almost, <laughs> it's almost, it's almost perverse. Uh, but my parents still don't have cell phones or internet or anything. They're kind of just going to neighbors who have wireless and just kind of checking their stuff. But they're, they're okay. Thank you. I appreciate your concern. Uh, what is this a picture of? <laughs> is this like NSW, NSFW or? Yeah, yeah, the horse guy. You see oh, that? Yeah. They actually identified him too. Yeah, it was this guy jogging in Washington had a horse head on. It really freak people out. <laughs> it's like a side of the mind apocalypse from the other one. Yeah, yeah, Letterman and Fallon that shows empty audiences. And the show must go on. So speaking of, oh, any questions about anything we covered last week with Kilo? Alien reviewing questions? No? Okay, good. And again, I'm sorry, Clark couldn't come here. He's, I still haven't heard from him. He's probably without power also. So uh, hopefully when I teach this again in the spring, I can bring Clark back to talk to the class, but that won't help you. <laughs> so we're in New York now, and we're talking about a case from New York. <coughs> Loretta V. Teleprompter, OK? So first of all, here's a picture of the, of the actual building at issue in Loretto, OK? You see there's like this little thing going up the side of it? That's actually the cable at issue in the case. It's actually not invisible, and it goes all the way up, all the way up, has these brackets there, and you can kind of see, if you look closely, it swirls up and kind of hooks up over the roof. And the roof, there was a number of uh, boxes and screws and various things. Um, here's a picture of what it looks like today, courtesy of Google. Um, the, you can still see the... Uh, bad contrast. We can still see the duct going up, and that's where all the wires come in from the street. And uh, just to give you a sense of where this place is, um, I'm sure right now it's also underwater or, or, or close to it. Let's zoom out. Zoom. 
So it's on West 150th Street. This is the west side. Um, so Manhattan roughly is divided in half. Central Park's in the middle. You're the west of Central Park. You're on the west side. You're the east. You're on the east side. Um, so this is the Upper West Side, which is actually a really nice neighborhood. Riverside Drive uh, is actually one of, like a, one of the better streets. So between Riverside and Broadway, very good area. Um, huge dog run here. And this is the Hudson River right here. Um, so they're really close to the water. I'm guessing that they probably had some significant flooding yesterday. And, of course, there's Jersey right across the river. If you zoom out a little bit more, you'll see... A little bit further uptown, this is a George Washington Bridge. This is the main crossover to the uptown. And here is Flooded Staten Island right there. The entire uh, boardwalk here, the ocean front in front of Staten Island, was all flooded. I live roughly here, or my parents live roughly here, so they weren't too far, but they were close enough that it was kind of potentially scary. Okay. So before we talk much about this case, let's, let's kind of break down the issues. I think the, the opinions jumped a little bit too far without really explaining what was going on. We have the takings clause, and we talked about it last week. So there's a couple things the takings clause look at. It says, you know, is there a taking? Right? Uh, is it taking for public use? And if so, is there just compensation? The Kilo case focused entirely on the second question, is it taking for public use? There was no question that demolishing students at Kilo's house to build a Pfizer facility was taking it for property. There was really no question about that. The question was, is it for public use? The question today, though, is trickier. Is there actually a taking? With Kilo, it was simple. They demolished her house, they took a property, no question. With this case, though, it's not so clear. And even between the two sets of justices and the majority and dissent, it's really not clear what's even going on. So what actually happened in this case? What was actually being installed? I uh, started there. Will? What was actually being installed on uh, Loretto's building? Uh, it was a cable wire. And they installed a cable wire and a couple of Why were they installed? Um, Order to give, I think, a building next door to them as well as. I think a building next door to them came on. I'm not sure if they're building the wall Yeah. Right, right. So basically, everyone know what cable TV is. Everyone know how, everyone know how it works. Oh. Anyone? What? Mark, you know how it works? R roughly. You don't have to give any detail. Right. So, so, uh, anyone ever see the Brady Bunch movie? The, the original, like the one in the 90s? I remember there was a scene where they called them and, and uh, they were trying to sell them cable TV. And uh, uh, Peter Bra Greg Brady goes, Cable TV? When will they learn or something? He kind of says this like fiction. It's a recently novel invention, the idea of sending signals over a cable. So, originally in the United States, all television signals were sent over the air. But it was very difficult for people in remote areas to get these signals. People in the mountains, people in the fields, you just don't get it. So uh, a number of TV stations actually started sending the signals through cables, which would then be broadcast through the air. So it was almost like a repeater, right? But in the 1950s and 60s, there started to be a movement to actually offer television directly over the cable. There were not any additional channels. There's still the big, big CBS, NBC, and then later ABC, which came much later. So there's only three or four channels, and then PBS came back in the 60s and 70s. But Cable works by having a single coaxial cable, and on that cable, there can be up to 500, 600, 1,000 various channels being sent. Each channel has a unique frequency. So when you change a channel on your remote on your cable set-top box, it's actually tuning to a different frequency. So in any given one cable, they can fit as many frequencies as there are channels. Uh, if you ever know about people buying illegal cable, the reason why they had that was people could just tap into those cables, splice it, and then suck in the, uh, suck in the channels. And then maybe you guys are aware of this, but then they start scrambling those channels, and that's why they were encrypted, to make sure people couldn't steal the signals. So when you have that little cable set-top box on your TV, what it's doing is taking all the signals coming on the cable, decrypting it, and then whenever you press a button to watch this or that, it pulls it up. 
Um, video on demand works slightly different because it's a two-way channel. But for the most part, cable TV is a one-way direction. Uh, the the two-way channel has other complicated things which I don't want to get into now. But in order for there to be cable TV, there has to be a, a network of cables actually connecting places. Um, and in the early days in New York City, there wasn't any. Uh, New York City in particular is a good place to have cable TV because of the tall buildings. It's actually very difficult to get signals. Um, radio signals are always messed up with the, with the canyons. So New York City had this idea of saying, hey, we want to promote access to cable television. We're going to let people stream uh, cables from you know, house to house to house to house, which is not too different than how, for example, telephone wires have been installed in the past, um, how electrical cables have been installed. You have you know, telephone poles with uh, connecting power lines. Everything's connected. So the idea was we're just going to make people put something small, you know, a wire, maybe, maybe this thin, up on your building, connect to the next house. It's not a thing obtrusive. And um, uh, Philip, so New York passed a statute. What did the statute do? Okay, so let's stop there. Before you read this case, let's see, Jonathan, before you read this case and you read about the statute that makes them put a cable on the roof and pay one dollar, how did you characterize that statute? What do you think about it? Do you think there's anything wrong with it? Before you read the actual Yeah, before you, you know, read the entire case and the opinion. Okay. So, Jonathan, based on what we learned last week or on Monday about the Kilo case, what potential problems do you see here under the Fifth Amendment? Um, public use. Okay, let's talk about public use. Is there any problem under the public use clause? I can see that there's an argument that we public use. Is it? Good. So does everyone have cable? Or do people pay for it? So, but even back then, not everyone had it. So um, I think that's one issue. So the public use. Tori, what about what about the one dollar? Did that bother you? Alex, what about the fact that they had to put this wire on the roof? Do you see any problem with that as a taking? Before you read the case, you're just thinking about the statute by itself. It's like trivial and like a little stupid thing. And okay, so so this case, there are a lot of issues that New York City didn't really anticipate when they passed this law. They didn't really characterize as a taking. And in fact, it's almost more like you're just paying a fee just to use your land. But it, it kind of goes deeper than that. So let's just start first with, is cable TV a public use? Um, I asked you the question, people have to pay for cable TV. Um, that was kind of a red herring, because there are a lot of things that are public that you still have to pay for. For example, um, common carriers. Everyone know what a common carrier is? Railroad, you have to pay for a ticket. Telephone? You need to pay your phone bill. Electricity, you need to pay your electric bill. Gas, pay your gas bill. So the mere fact that you're paying for it doesn't make it not a public use. Public parks, sometimes you have to pay your park fee to get into the park. So that's not a problem. The other issue about being a common carrier is that to be available to everyone on equal footing, meaning they can't discriminate. So if you want to go buy cable from Comcast, they can't tell you no. You know, most businesses, they can decline serving you. But if you want to buy a cable from Comcast, I mean, as long as I think they check your credit and uh, maybe you have to live in a certain area that they have service, but as soon as you meet whatever general criteria, they have to serve you. So there's not really a question with this for public use. But I think this statute, as it was conceived by New York, wasn't viewed under the taking power. Um, 
Uh, Jennifer, what kind of <coughs> under what kind of authority do you think New York enacted this law? Good. Explain. Excellent. That's exactly right. New York City had been passing laws governing landlord building. I'm sorry, uh, buildings in New York City for you know, for decades, forever. They simply thought that this was another thing that they could do to promote the safety and welfare. Um, I think I think either someone mentioned uh, emergency uh, TV channels um, when cable TV was first coming on the air. One of the requirements the FCC imposed was you had to have public access television. Everyone know about that? Everyone, everyone like watching like two in the morning those really crappy TV shows like on public community TV. Those are required by law. So in order to get the spectrum, they need to have those channels. Also, everyone ever watch C-SPAN? Please say yes. Good. Okay. Everyone just watch C-SPAN at least once. You'll turn it off or just watch it once. Brian Lamb, who was a founder of C-SPAN, negotiated with the with the FCC that if any Entity wants a cable license, they need to provide C-SPAN access. That's actually required by, by statute, or maybe it's by regulation, but it's required by something. So there is this need to provide this information to the public. So New York simply thought, hey, we want to have our people connected to this public information and these channels and stuff. So that's part of the police power. In Kilo, one of the main criticisms of Justice Stevens was that he inflated the police power and the um, takings power. So uh, Rebecca. If if this law was passed under the police power, would they need to pay a dollar? No, no, no. But just do they have to put that in the statute? Why? Right. So let's think about it this way. This entire case boiled down to how you characterize a statute. If New York City passed a law pursuant to the police power and say, we want to have cable TV for people to improve access to public access television and C-SPAN so if they can watch parliamentary debates and whatever, whatever their craft there is on C-SPAN, that would have been fine. But I think what, what probably did them in was the fact that they, they put a dollar in there. And they made it seem like that was the compensation for the, 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 the imposition of the difficulties. Um, Nicholas, the opinion mentions a number of other things that New York City has done over the years forcing the uh, landlords to install stuff in their building and do various things. What are some of those things? It was mentioned, I think it was towards the end, my, uh, mostly in the dissent, I think. David? Matthew? OK, good. Yeah. Alyssa? Oh, oh, and um, I remembered. Uh, everyone, please donate to the food drive. You want to say a word about that? Because you're next up. Ooh. Wow. Wrong answer. Will. <laughs> Uh, try to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so off the record, one professor told me that she, she would give those anyway, even if they didn't have a food drive incentive. That's the rub. Ah. Another professor told me that she gives incentives with food drive. She would give those even if she didn't make the threshold. Mm. Anyway. So no help here. So yes, Will, you're right. There have been a number of things that New York City and for all cities have done to improve the ability of tenants to live in their building. So um, requirements by doors and lights, you know, windows and skylights, uh, having locks, having an intercom on your front door, 
having an attendant in the lobby, a doorman, if, if, if you will, uh, installing peepholes. Uh, th those are those are very important in New York City. Uh, putting mirrors in an elevator. Do you know what those are? So if you're looking to go into an elevator, there are going to be mirrors in the corner so you can see someone's lurking and hiding behind so you don't get mugged. Yeah, you ever notice those? That's why they're there. Because if you're, if you're, you know, the elevator's here, right? And you're going in, the guy could be standing like right behind the door, the button thingy. So you can just look in and see people. That's why they're there. You know that? You learn something every day. We take property from New Yorkers. It's probably a little too much dangerous stuff. Uh, fire sprinklers. Uh, fire code's been around for probably, oh, 60, 70 years. You need to install sprinklers in every apartment. And that's actually really complicated. It's not just like putting in a doorbell or a peephole or like, you know, a mirror. Uh, sprinkler systems are expensive. Uh, they require running the water up pipes, uh, the little uh, thermostat thingies to, to spray the water. Uh, you know, they're all the controls. It's a lot. Um, these have been things that have been going on in New York City for 50 years. And no one, well, maybe other than crazy libertarians, but no one thought that these laws were a violation of the takings clause. I'm one of them. But, but no one thought that these laws were a violation of the takings clause. Why? Because they're pursuant to the police power. They didn't even get the taking. So, you know, we think of, like, this is, like, the police power. Like, the takings clause is, like, you know, maybe, like, intersecting it somewhere there. So if once you're in the police power, you don't need to take it. This case is kind of like on the verge, but it really, according to the sense, shouldn't be. Um, there was a, a case from 1946. It was in a footnote. Queenside Hills Realty Company versus Saxel uh, by a good old womanizing Justice Douglas. Um, and, and he effectively said, uh, many types of social legislation diminish the value of property, but too bad. We are dealing with, a, you know, a law that's meant to help people, and uh, the statute we sustain because it's within the police power. So the, um, what do you call it, the reasoning behind this case is simply that as long as something is going to be helping people, you don't need to pay a taking, there's no compensation. Okay? That's what the dissent argues. Uh, uh, Kendall, why then is this case considered not under the police power, but under the takings power. Is that what did him in? Let's, before we can get to what the Supreme Court said, let's just look at how the case was um, you know, argued. Why, why would this be you know, if you're in New York City, why would you even argue that this is a taking? Why would you just argue we just have a police power? We're going to do it anyway. Is it? I thought we said cable TV is. Well, well, let's look at it this way. If it wasn't for the public good, that, which is easier to satisfy, Kendall? The public use clause or the police power? Which is easier to satisfy? Yeah, because police power is almost without limits. So that's your that's your safe bet. That's your argument. You say police power, police power, police power. Um, I don't know the answer to the question I just asked you, so I'm you know not faulting for for giving no answer. Um, there's no, it's not clear why New York decides to give that one dollar compensation. Maybe they were trying to be nice, but more likely than not, in the process of trying to be nice, they probably did themselves in because they made it look like it was a taking. Because the New York courts actually considered whether it was a taking. The New York courts decided whether that taking was a just compensation. And that probably did them in. If they would have just passed this the same way they passed laws governing telephone wires and electrical cables and gas pipes and intercoms and mirrors and the elevators and all these other uh, uh, restrictions, they probably would have been fine. Um, before I leave this point, one issue to, to raise is actually uh, rent control. Uh, Lauren, did you, did you see something in the opinion about rent control? Anyone, did anyone see that? It might have been it was, it was somewhere buried. It wasn't, wasn't totally clear, but maybe one or two sentences. Okay, so everyone knows what rent control is? Right. What was in the notes? Okay. I never remember what the stuff is. Uh, that stuff you usually skip over? The three weeks left in the semester? Yeah. We have three classes after this, by the way. It's insane. Yeah, I know. I have no idea. 
if I didn't have videos every class, they wouldn't believe they actually happened. Um, so after World War II, um, when there was a huge influx of population and a lot of people were turning from war, New York City had the idea of stabilizing rent prices. They didn't want prices to keep going up because, as you know, when supply stays the same and demand goes up, your prices go up. So New York City had the genius idea of stabilizing the rent prices in the 1940s. Um, it's been an unmitigated disaster, um, and, and there's no other way to say it. Um, most of the people who live in the rent control apartments aren't poor people. I mean, you're going to find some you know, elderly people who have been living in apartments for 70 years. For the most part, they're well-connected people who have been able to get in at a cheap price. Um, I think uh, it was Yoko, Yoko Ono who, uh, actually Paul McCartney had said that she did not break up the Beatles, uh, so I guess that's that. But Yoko Ono has a rent control apartment. Uh, Mia Farrow has a rent control apartment. Um, it's actually quite, uh, if you actually look at the rent lizard, it's actually almost amazing. Um, the incidence of arson in rent control buildings is actually so high. Um, I, I had an economics professor in law school who would show us buildings of, from war and show us buildings that are rent controlled and try to figure out which was which because they usually end up firebombed either way. Uh, it's actually it's, it's, it's hilarious. Um, and also, there are always movements to kind of you know, stabilize rent, but the landlords do everything they can to get out the people who are rent controlled. Um, it's just been a bad situation. But the Supreme Court said it's not a taking. Why? Anyone see why? I'll claim a second. Anyone see why it's not a taking? Because they're not required to rent apartments to anyone. They don't have to rent it to anyone. They can just let the apartment lie vacant, so there's no taking. They're not, there's no invasion. They can, they can just let the apartment lie empty. Um, that's absolutely specious reasoning, but that's our Supreme Court precedent. Yes, sir? Where is it? Thank you. Yeah, this is this, Maddox. Yes. Yeah, actually, last year the Supreme Court had a petition for certiorari on the issue of rent control in New York City, and they actually called for the views of New York City to reply, but they didn't grant the petition. Um, I, I don't think there's any ground in which a court will strike down a rent control statute. Um, so I want to talk about it from a constitutional perspective, but from a public policy perspective, they're really bad things. They artificially inflate the price of real estate. Because you have some people in the building who are paying like $300 a month of rent for a huge apartment. Everyone else has to pay higher rents. Um, it decreases the ability to build new stock because if any buildings are designated as rent control, no one wants to own them. And if you actually were going to build new stock, no one wants a building designated as rent control. So that actually decreases construction. Um, all the things that make Houston more amenable to building, it's the exact opposite in New York. Uh, totally random, I was at dinner the other night with a developer. Uh, he runs a, he's a GC for a construction company in Houston. And he said they've actually pulled out all their business in Dallas and San Antonio because it's so much cheaper and easier to build here, more profitable. He's doing almost all their business in Houston now. Uh, and he, he gave me some numbers, but he said it's just so much easier and cheaper to build here than anywhere else. It's actually, uh, he's doing great for himself, but uh, the, the market is still, still raging for him. Yep. So the dissent makes, I think, what's, what's a, point, a point that uh, just Marshall does not really do any job rebutting. But why is this law different from laws requiring sprinklers or smoke detectors or cable or, or power lines? There's really no principal difference. Um, and if you look at things like electrical lines and cable lines, they're probably going up the exact same shaft. I mean, they're probably all going up the same the same thing that goes up and down. Anyway. Oh, computer. I'll have a new one that's... Yeah, this thing. The thing that goes up and down. They probably have the same cable going up and down. Okay? So that's the, the broader issue of this mapping. No one will scrutinize. I mean, no one's going to scrutinize the um, police power that closely. Um, and even under public use, if economic development is good enough for public use, then providing television people for public use. Yeah, the public use prong here is not really that much in dispute. Um, I'm sure you can make a very libertarian argument as to why access to cable television 
that's not a public use. It could be obtained through satellite or internet connection or various other things. But generally, these are viewed as common carriers that they provide signals to people. Um, the trigger issue is with monopolies. Because what happened in the 70s was that you had a lot of cable companies trying to become the monopoly provider. So you guys all have Comcast? You know, not have Comcast? We're doing Universe, good, okay. So for about 20 years, that didn't exist. That's actually relatively new. For most of the 70s and 80s, most cities or, or towns would give a monopoly charter to one cable TV provider. Only one would get it. And they would usually be forced to set rates by the public uh, state commission, whatever the relevant agency is. Um, then when satellites start coming to the play, that, so that monopolies are breaking down. Um, and then when Uverse came into play and Verizon Fios, that started breaking down more. I had one case when I was clerking involving Uverse. The local ca cable company um, was offering television in a, in a place. And then Uverse, which didn't have a t uh, at and owned Uverse, they didn't have a television license, they had a telephone license, and they attempted to use their telephone license to provide TV service. Mm -hmm. And um, there was actually a dispute over whether their telephone license allowed them to provide TV service. The reason why they didn't have a TV license because the city didn't want to give it to them because they want to keep their monopoly with their local buddy. So there's Uverse at a very difficult time breaking into some markets because the incumbent cable company stopped it at all costs. Um, and that's why at t has tried to rely on their telephone license saying that cable te the, the television is similar to telephone, although I think it's a dispute whether they're similar because it's a two-way versus one-way, uh, but it's, it's an open question. But the idea of monopoly cartels for cable companies is quite old. Fortunately, you'll have choice of what you can get Files is also for fiber optic, so they don't have to worry about the same kind of issues because they already have lines going right into the house, and they spend billions of dollars uh, constructing that. Okay? So let's actually talk about another issue, and I'm intentionally not going over the Marshall opinion because it's not very good, but let's just talk about a couple other, other issues. Does anyone know the difference between a categorical and a per se rule is? Anyone? Let's go categorical versus per se. Anyone know? I mean, the topic of this of this lesson is categorical regulatory takings. Does anyone think about what that means? All right. So a categorical. A categorical rule is, is roughly a bright line rule where if something fits into a specific category, it satisfies certain conditions. So, for example, the categorical rule here is that if there is a permanent physical occupation, it's a taking. No ifs, ands, or buts. There's no balancing, you know. Uh, there's no balancing, uh, there's no interest analysis. So if it falls into a category, then a rule satisfied. It's also called a per se rule, which everyone means, everyone says use, people often use the word per se, meaning, you know, by itself. Or how, how do you guys use it? Yeah, people use it in common parlance. It really means like by itself. But people often use it, you know, incorrectly. But but here it means in Latin, you know, it's automatically uh, fits in. Okay. Uh, is there a current class action against cable companies creating monopoly against Comcast? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I'm not not sure. Um, I can't imagine it. Would, I know I know Comcast has had. Um, uh, antitrust concerns because they recently purchased NBC from Universal. Um, and now if you've noticed that all well, the Comcast Sport Networks are not called NBC Sports, or no, no, or, or the, um, now there's all these Comcast Sport Networks popping up. That's a, that's a byproduct of that. But Comcast owns NBC Universal, and that's actually changed their internet provider name to Xfinity for some of their related reason. Oh, and as part of that merger, they were required to provide cable internet access to uh, low-income people over the country. That's part of the uh, Deal they, uh, deal they struck. So a categorical rule is just that, it's automatic. 
And then I guess the opposite of a categorical rule is maybe called a balancing test or an interest analysis or something like that. And this is exactly what it says. It considers many factors. It's not automatic. A court's decision to impose a categorical test versus a balancing test is very, very important. Everyone remember strict liability in courts? Remember that? So if you were dealing with certain very highly dangerous materials, like maybe if you're dealing with TNT or some sort of you know really dangerous thing and your the tort happens, you're liable automatically. There's no there's no there's no balancing of the issues, right? Did anyone not like strict liability when you cited in torts? Uh, I might. But George Mason, we don't like strict liability. <laughs> I think I had an entire class of why it was bad. But um, it, it's a good thing that makes things simple. Because once you have TNT in your hands and there's a blow up, there's, a, there's, a, there's liability. You're negligent. There's no, there's no question. But it doesn't allow any gives in the joint for various circumstances. Likewise, I think what the the sense faults the majority for most clearly is imposing this, this bright line categorical rule in a takings case. Uh, for years, the court has said that takings are very um, ad hoc. Everyone know what ad hoc means? Uh, you take each case as it comes. That there's no set formula, there's no set prescription. And the dissent really faults the majority for this. Hold on, how does the dissent phrase it? I like uh, the dissent uh, is authored by Justice Blackman again, told a U, not with an A, no, no relation. He said um, the court erects a strange and untenable distinction between temporary physical invasions, whose constitutionality conceivably is subject to a balancing approach, and permanent physical occupations, which are taken to that regard that a fact that the court might or not examine. So the court sets up this distinction then, the majority between uh, temporary physical invasions and permanent physical occupations. If something falls into this category, it goes to a balance effect. If something falls into this category, it goes to the categorical per se analysis. If something falls into this one, it's unconstitutional. There's really no question. Once once you go here, it's a taking. There, there's no analysis. If you go here, there's a taking. So before we get too far into the nuances of the taking doctrine, uh, who are we up to? I go down Lauren Eduardo. What do you think? What do you think judges and parties will do? Given this, this kind of this, this, these two paths, how do you think parties and judges will handle it? What do you think they'll do? Good. Okay, I, that, that's most what I wanted. So, Isen, if you are a city, right? And you want to, you know, install something in some building, or you want to make a building do something. How are you going to characterize that requirement in the statute? Yeah. What happened if the statute instead of saying, "Hey, we're putting this," uh, um you know, <coughs> cable here forever, we're going to put it here for five years. And every five years we'll renew it to a dollar. Would that be permanent? Ben, what do you think? Would that be permanent? Yeah, and it's... No. No, it would be the city's choice for now. But is that would that be permanent? Would that be temporary? Good. And and the uh, the dissent gets this indirectly. They said cable TV is not forever. I guarantee you that if you look at uh, 
it was the image. I guarantee you, if you look at the roof as it exists now, those cables are not there anymore. They're not. They've probably been replaced with some high-definition digital TV or, or something much more sophisticated. By framing it in terms of permanency, the court never defined what permanency is. Does that mean the rule against perpetuity? It's forever. I mean, you know, like a diamond. It's, it's going to be there you know, indefinitely. No. Is it going to be there from 1975 until they invent digital cable in 1990? Is 15 years permanent or temporary? There's really no answer to that because they don't. So if you're the city of New York and you want to avoid Loretto the teleprompter, all you have to do is phrase it in terms of being temporary, saying we give this you know, for a five-year option or a ten-year option, even a twenty-year option, however you much you want to structure the time, but you don't make it permanent. Okay. If you are a court, a lower court, not Supreme Court, but if you're a lower court, uh, Medea, do you think lower court judges like things like strict liability and bright line rules? Really? Anyone ever clerk for a judge? Well, did your judge like bright line rules or things that gave him flexibility? Yeah, Will's more right. Uh, uh, if you ever spend time around judges, and I hope you all have time to call for extern, it's an amazing experience. You'll, you'll learn more than you will in the entire three of the law school. One semester under, you know, in a court after you'll learn more than you will from any of us. So, so most lower court judges, trial judges, like having discretion. They like having discretion. They don't like these bright line rules. So if the Supreme Court gives them this test, right, you can either use Balancing or categorical idea? Do you think courts be more or less likely to shoehorn stuff into here? And with, with, with pure sincerity, they say, listen, this cable TV is not going to be there forever. The cable we've for five years or ten years. That's temporary. They are complying with the Supreme Court's mandate. They are choosing this path. And then they can look at the factors saying, we don't think it's a, you know, we don't think it's a taking, or it might be a taking, but one dollar sufficient. This is an ongoing debate between categorical rules and kind of balancing tests. Um, this comes up a lot with. Uh, uh, anyone know about the Armed Career Criminal Act over here? That ACCA. So it's somewhat like a three-strike law for federal sentencing, but not exactly. Where, say you're, you know, busted for, you know, a federal drug offense, which I think, you know, a significant number of Americans are. But say you're busted for a federal drug offense. And say you had two previous crimes under state law. Say you, um, you know, you evaded the police. Say you just, the police were chasing and you fled. And say that you um, uh, uh, harassed, you know, uh, a girlfriend, but you didn't actually touch her. The way the ACCA is structured is that if you have two or more crimes of violence, two or more crimes of violence, that's how it's defined, crimes of violence, you're going to go to jail prior for 30 years. I mean, it, it's a re I mean, I'm simplifying, but the numbers are staggering. So even if you get busted for like having like, you know, a gram of, or maybe five grams of like, you know, uh, powder cocaine, something not that significant, but you have these two previous crimes of violence, you're going to be in jail for the rest of your life or close to it, depending on what you are. The tricky part is defining what it is that's a crime of violence. That's a very um, difficult thing. And because you have to look at state law, there's no federal definition. And the courts have taken a categorical approach where if something falls into the broad category of violence, then you're going to jail for a long time. So I use a couple examples. Uh, fleeing the police. That's a crime of violence. Why? Because when you're driving your car and evading police, you might be able to hit someone. That could be a crime of violence. Uh, there was a case, um, uh, drawing a blank on the name, where they actually produced in Supreme Court record video footage of this guy driving his car and swerving. Uh, no one actually got hurt, but it was considered a crime of violence. Um, uh, a domestic misdemeanor, say if you're harassing a girlfriend beyond she touch her, 
you know, there's no, there's no batteries, no physical contact, uh, that's also a crime of violence. Uh, because as there are various tests for propensity to cause harm, all these various things to consider. But it's a categorical approach. And lower courts have tried to chip away at this thing. Well, you know, we understand there's this categorical approach, but we don't think this fits into it. We think it's in the balancing approach. We think it's something else. So when you give a lower court these choices between categorical, uh, a categorical approach versus a kind of a balancing approach, courts will be more likely to try and fit something into here, given more flexibility. The Supreme Court, of course, doesn't like that. They like to have clear, established rules and norms, and they want everything to be, you know, formulaic. And the ACC has been an absolute nightmare to administer. We have probably every year at the Supreme Court two or three cases uh, discussing, you know, what it is that's a crime of violence. Every year it's like two or three cases. And all these various things come up. You know, uh, if you, if you, yeah, I mean, there, there's so many, there's so many various uh, cases. I'll look some more up later and explain it. But it's a categorical tests are very difficult. And the Blackman dissent effectively says, listen, you think you're so smart because you're making this, uh, this, this categorical rule. All judges are going to do is say stuff fits in the other one. Um, and I assign these cases probably not in the best sequence, but the case we're supposed to read for Wednesday, Penn Central, did anyone ever hear of it? Anyone read it yet? No. Okay. So, actually, it's for, it's for Monday. So, the Penn Central case involved, I'll give you a little preview, uh, Grand Central Station in Manhattan. It's this huge train station, right? And, you know, if you look at the skyline of New York, skyscraper, skyscraper, skyscraper is like a little train station. So in the 60s, these developers paid the idea of building up, effectively building a skyscraper on top of the train station. Anyone remember that? That was a huge thing. And there were all these, you know, historical landmark societies, all these other, you know, you'll, you'll read about it for class on, on, uh, on Monday. But the court for Justice Brandon made this very complicated formula to find out whether there was a taking or not. It's like, really? The, it's going to be a pain in the ass to read that, I'm just warning you. It's difficult to read, but it's a really complicated formula. And that was in the late 70s. In this case, I think it was 82 or 84 or something. So now we go from this really complicated ad hoc balancing test. Because when I say balancing, I'm talking about Penn Central. And it's a really difficult test to apply, and I'll do my best to explain it. But now, once you have a little stupid cable, then you're, in, you're, you're smooth sailing. Then you have a bright line rule. And it's almost anomalous that... If you have some rule, you know, if you tell a train station they cannot build a 70-story skyscraper, that's not a taking under here. But then you tell Loretto, if you put this two-inch cable on your roof, it is a taking. Does that make any sense? Even more so, on remand, the New York Court of Appeals only gave one dollar in damages. One dollar in damages. And the dissent says something like, you know, if we're talking about one dollar in trivial damages, like Alex mentioned before, is this even worth it? Is this a con you know a constitutional crisis of no moment? Why are we fighting over something so trivial? Which then brings us to the key question, which I probably should have done first, but I think it makes more sense now, uh, uh, Brandon. Is actually this a taking of putting a stupid little cable? Is it you know is there actually any kind of uh, uh, is this de minimis? Is this so inconsequential we shouldn't even care about it? Yeah, what was Marshall said? Good. Let's talk about that. Hmm? Take your time. Okay. So what's interesting about this case is the lineup. The majority was by Justice Marshall. Uh, who is no fan of property rights. I've actually been trying to figure out why he was given this opinion. Um, the most likely explanation is that Chief Justice Berger, who is the majority, gave it to him to get a six-vote block instead of a five-vote block, and that made those more palatable. Uh, Marshall's opinion, though, was very um, clear on the physical takings, was much more nebulous about the other takings. He said a lot of other stuff would be okay. So that might be why Marshall wrote it. But the Marshall opinion says that the, the right to possess, use, and dispose of property are the most important, you know, from bundles of sticks, you know, the most important bundles, and the right to exclude. Well, let's, let's go through them one at a time. Um, uh, Catherine, how does, how does this New York statute restrict the right to possess? Yeah, 
Yeah, yes, that that thing that's there no matter what, and it's not just this. There are also some metal boxes and screws and spikes and various uh, uh, various other things, but th that's always going to be there. Okay, but is it always there? And smart, good. After 20 classes, you're picking up my little tricks. That's right. I should, re I should remove my transition words to be tougher on you. So that's right. It's unclear whether we talk about you know, the right to possess. Is the possess only applying if it's temporary or permanent? Why is there a distinction? Why should it even matter? If I have the right to possess this important stick in my bundle, and there's this stupid cable going with my building, why do I care if it's there for one year, five years, or ten years? Why should it make any difference? Amanda, like, what, why should it make any difference if the cable is there for one year? It's it's my right to possess. Why why should it be triggered by a time frame? So then do we so then we're, we're we're weighing interest. How substantial is the impairment? I think that's what you said. But isn't isn't this a a a, a, a categorical analysis? Ah. So even the de and that's a good point that you touch on. Even the decision to go into the categorical analysis is this, is this a permanent taking requires you to to balance things of how permanent it is, how substantial is this impairment on my rights. So it's it's not even as categorical as the majority of making things. You first have to decide: is this you know temporary? Is this permanent? Is it substantially impairing my property values? These are all the questions you have to answer. Okay. So the second one. Is uh, so uh, Zeke. Uh, the second one is the right to use. How is this right infringed? How is this stick snapped? I guess or how I would say. It. Should it matter if he was going to use it in any other way? No. Mm. Is that what the majority said or was it the sense said? <coughs> right, so again, we have a bright line categorical rule. I think most people would say it's a matter of common sense. If he's not going to be using, you know, these three inches on this outside of his building, how can we possibly say that that's violating his right to use? Or we simply say that the right to use is some sort of absolute, and it doesn't matter if he's actually going to use it. It's maybe he might, maybe he might not. Uh, yes, no, maybe so. But it's clear that he was not going to use this, this, you know, this strip of cable outside his building. What about uh, uh, Ray? The right to dis uh, dispose. Okay, let's ask like this. If he sold it, wouldn't the next landlord be subject to the same New York statute? And what's the problem with disposing it? It's not like you're burdening the next guy. He's subject to the same law. If the New York City law requires a sprinkler system, and that increases the property value by, say, $10,000, wouldn't that inhibit his ability to sell it to someone else? So how is this any different? So is there actually any kind of limitation on the right to dispose of the property? Um, all of New York's stupid laws do that. All of them do that. That impose requirements of mirrors and intercoms and doormen and Sprinkle system and all these all these laws that make it more expensive to deal property. We went through the housing prices, and you know, significantly. It's a lot tougher to dispose of property in New York City because the prices can be higher. I mean, you might make a profit, but it's going to be hard to find buyers for, the, for those prices. So, I don't know that, and the reason why I don't want to talk too much about the Marshall opinion is not very good. I mean, he sets out these three things: the right to possess, use, and dispose of. Those are very important sticks, and I don't see how any. I, I don't see how the exact 
test uses fits this case. Because each of those three things, as we discussed between the, a lot of you, are not satisfied. Now, there are some good parts about this in that it's simple uh, to decide. When we talk about Penn Central, when we talk about some of the cases involving beat from property in the next week, um, it's often very difficult to find out this cake. Here it's easy, right? Look, there. there right, right there, that's it. There, there's, no, there's no question. It's not like, how do we value the air rights of Grand Central Station, or how do we value the deprivation of use of the beach in Galveston? You know, these are, these are tougher questions how we can do so There's fewer proof problems. Yeah. Now, at the end of Marshall's opinion, he stresses vehemently that this will not have any consequences on the ability to adjust landlord-tenant relationships. Um, and he still says the state has a broad power to regulate housing and landlord relationships that paying compensation. Again, it's not clear why this is not such a case. If New York had passed the exact same statute that the one dollar uh, payment, I don't think this case would have gone anywhere because it would have just been another New York regulation under the police power. I mean, New York was actually trying to help people out and give them a dollar. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's not it's not insignificant, but it's something. Listen. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure they were ticked about that. I mean, I'm guessing the reason why they probably did that was because uh, it was jacking up costs and it was becoming too expensive to build up the infrastructure. Because if you think about it, in the 70s, they didn't have the infrastructure. They didn't have all the, all the cables. They wanted to make it as easy as possible to spread. That's probably why they did it. So by taking away that 5%, it made it easier for the tenants to you know, get cable. Because before, if a company was willing to pay that 5%, they probably couldn't build out. Um, and back then, there weren't many channels. There were only a couple channels. There, there weren't that many. In fact, uh, a lot of cable TV simply rebroadcasted stuff that was over the air. So there wasn't, there wasn't much. Um, actually, do you know what the main uh, content of early cable TV was? The rerun, the repeat. You know that didn't exist in like the 50s and 60s? That wasn't a thing. They, they were, there were no repeats. And it was only when cable came about that repeat started. Um, and this is actually even more tragic. In the 1950s and 60s and 40s, no one thought that recording programs was worthwhile. They would routinely record over tapes to save money. So there's entire um, generations of TV and film that's just gone the ages. Um, there was something called a kinetoscope, which could be used. You think about it, it was a putting a, a camera in front of a TV, that's, that's really what it was, and recording it off the TV. It was like you know, a, a DVR back in the 50s. But, and these things usually exist in private collections. So um, actually a couple years ago, the uh, World Series between the, between the Yankees and the Pirates, uh, with Bill Mazeroski, was it 1960-ish? 60, yeah. That video where uh, Bill Mazeroski, um, uh, and then, um, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the it was the one between the, the Yankees and the Pirates, and also the one between the Giants. And the, so this is one with the uh, the Yankees, and um, Game Seven of that series where Mazeroski hit a home run in Game Seven, that had been lost to the ages. Like that video did not exist anywhere. And about a year or two, maybe two years ago, Bing Crosby's uh, estate found a reel of it in his uh, cellar, in his wine cellar, and they actually rebroadcast it on on a, on an ESPN Classic or something. It was the first time the game had been watched in 50 years. Um, it's amazing that so much TV was just lost because they wanted to record over the tapes because it was a way to save money. So one of the first things that started happening with cable TV was repeats. They needed something, so they just started showing episodes of like you know whatever they had, and they started saving shows and repeating them, and that was how repeats were invented. Anyone ever see Back to the Future? There's a line uh, where um, uh, when Marty goes back to 1955 and they're watching the Jack and Gleason show, and then Marty goes, "Oh yeah, so then a repeat." And the kid goes, what's that? And you remember that line? Uh, that's why I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I speak truth. You didn't see Back to the Future? Go watch it. So, that, that, oh, what's that? So, uh, I'm not convinced that the regulatory taking case here was that was that influential because now all city has to do is 
is design their statutes in a way that it doesn't look like it's permanent. There can be a temporary physical invasion as opposed to a permanent physical occupation. As long as it's a temporary physical invasion, you're fine. You don't run afoul, you don't run afoul of the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of cases mentioned that, I, that I'll just draw your attention to because I think they're important uh, Supreme Court cases. There's a Hearts of Atlanta Motel case. Anyone know that one? Listen. <coughs> it is? That's, that's what I said. Tell me what it's about. Um, it was where the um, yeah. Um, and then, um, but the, the key, the, the right down, the yeah, I actually have a I have a postcard from Hearts Alliance Motel somewhere. I should have brought it up. I forgot. Um, yeah, and that's exactly right. And then uh, Thurgood Marshall said it's actually used to regulate discrimination in places of public accommodation. It wasn't really relevant because it, it was a Commerce Plus case versus here where it's say police power land, not really relevant. The other case, uh, home mortgage versus Blaisdell. This is a tougher one. Anyone remember this one? Ooh, on fire. Let's go. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and that case was based on what's called the um, the contracts clause. Everyone know about the contracts clause in the Constitution? It says that states cannot impair contracts. Um, that case effectively read the contracts clause out of the Constitution. So it doesn't matter. And they said, well, it's cabin to times of emergency. Although subsequent cases have said emergency is not quite so narrow. So really, if the state wants to, they can so, can so cabin it. Um, so I can find that, that postcard from the Hearts of Lamp from the case. OK. Uh, Bring that up. Okay, so that's that case. Bring it up later. Uh, of Atlanta. Okay, so that's that case. Uh, let's see. All right, let's go on to the next case briefly, and I don't think I'm assigning this case again next year. Um, for, for a couple reasons. Um, uh, one, if you couldn't tell, it's from 1915, and there hasn't been much litigation on this point in the last 90 years. Uh, so it's not too relevant. And two, it's just really difficult to read, unnecessarily so. Um, so the general, no, the general thrust of that case, though, is that regulation of a nuisance can maybe be a taking. So we had this brickyard in Cali, uh, in Los Angeles. And when the brickyard began, it was in an you know, outskirt of town, and it was fine. But soon the town annexed that land. And this is a place where they had really good clay. And they could bring the clay up and bake brick. Anyone know about baking brick? Has anyone ever done that? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Apparently it smells bad, and it creates soot. Yeah, I, I don't know. But apparently it, it creates a lot of damage. The, um, the owner of the brickyard said, hey, this is really bad. You know, if you pass this ordinance, you're going to ruin my business. Um, you know, I'm not bothering anyone. There are no complaints. And they said, no, 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 you're wrong. Um, this is bothering people. It creates noxious fumes. Um, it's not safe to in the city. And then the owner of the brickyard goes, hey, you're just singling me out. You're trying to, you know, give a monopoly to the brick managers. You're trying to uh, go after me. Uh, Dirty Jobs did an episode on it. Uh, these people tend to be very paranoid in general. Uh, people make these cases. No? Okay, so the, so the city was not being truthful? No. Okay. Yeah. So usually both parties are lying in these kinds of cases. But the important part was if this ordinance was allowed to go into effect, the guy's entire business would be shut down. Um, you know, this is not like you can, you know, move your, you know, 
bakery form, but it's the other, you're baking clay, and in order to bake the clay, you need to have all the clay in the ground below you. Um, uh, the opinion was actually by, Ju by Justice uh, McKenna. Uh, just a little bit of background for you. Uh, he actually served in all three branches of government. He was a member of the House, he was the Attorney General, and then um, President McKinley uh, appointed him to the Supreme Court, replaced Justice Fields, who was on the court for like 36 years. Um, interestingly enough, McKenna uh, voted in the majority in Lochner. Uh, yeah, in this case, he was very much deferential to the police power. Um, I will research that further when I get some time. Um, this you'll appreciate because you have to suffer for that case. Uh, Chief Justice Task asked him to resign because he was no longer able to write good opinions. Uh, he had a stroke or something, and his opinion ranks still went down very much. So this was actually one of his good ones. So imagine how the bad ones must have read. Uh, the Supreme Court said, um, oh, by the way, his track was worth $800,000. I converted that for inflation to worth about $18 million. So this was a not insignificant business. Uh, and the court said the police power is one of the most essential powers of government. Um, even if conditions change, even if at one point you can do something and later you can't, too bad. Um, quote, there must be progress, and if, if in its march private interests are in the way, it must yield to the good of the community. Um, he's effectively saying if the city decides that we need this to improve our condition, then too bad. If your business goes out of, uh, you're out of business, too bad. It doesn't really matter. Um, there's really not much of a consolation. There's no taking. Um, this this opinion can be seen as laying the groundwork for much environmental regulation, um, because lots of environmental regulation put people out of business, and there's really no uh, there's no taking. You don't get compensated when uh, when the city declares your your, your plot of land a wetland. Um, I was actually thinking about a potential permanent physical invasion is if an endangered species comes on your land. No, no don't tell people you kill it. <laughs> that, you no, know, well, you know, people are, you know, you, you have to be careful. Yeah, yeah, you have to be careful. So this is a, this can be seen as a kind of a laying a foundation for a lot of environmental regulation as long as the state has some sort of uh, stated interest in making things better, it's okay. Um, one interesting case to compare this to Remember the uh, Dell Webb case with the, uh, the feedlot in Arizona? Remember that case? Remember the, uh, the developer was building all these homes for retirees and it kept getting closer and closer to the feedlot and it became more and more stinky? Um, the court in that case, if you remember, split the baby. They said, all right, we're going to shut down the feedlot, but the developer has to pay the cost to relocate them. That case is in some tension with this case, and I'm not quite sure that they're reconcilable. Uh, Martin? What difference does it make? Yeah, but you did. That would make it stronger they would have to pay, no? Because when they take. Yeah, and the government's bound by the takings clause. The, the argument in favor of paying will be stronger here. Private individuals, if you bring a nuisance suit and you win, you shouldn't have to pay anything. Right, but that, that also the court fashion equity. But generally, if I sue you for being smelly, and you know, I don't have to pay you anything. You just have to be not smelly. Right, they couldn't. Like the, like the feedlot. The feedlot couldn't be moved. You can't move a, a couple thousand head of cattle or whatever you have to do. That's what I had up there, Michael. What's that? Assume it was pre-existing, I think. I think it might have been, but it's just assume it was pre-existing. Well, uh, right, so so do you think do you think the city should have to compensate, shut down the plant? Mm -hmm. Well, this case is 90 years old. The reason why it's not very useful is because this is 1915. This predates most you know, health safety regulations and, you know, in New York City, you know, I listed a number of them, but there are a lot of regulations that make your property worth less and there are a lot of ways that New York City can shut down your business by not giving the proper licenses or proper permits. Uh, and the city is not on the hook to pay you otherwise. Um, 
you know, I mean, there are all these businesses now in New York City who their their, <laughs> their businesses were just swept into the ocean. And they're not going to be they're not going to get paid by anyone uh, uh, for this. Um, usually, when you run a business, you you assume certain risks. Uh, and in New York City, one of these risks is the government. What's that? Unless you're GM. Unless you're a GM bondholder, though, that's a different story. All right. So don't worry too much about that last case because um, it's really not too too relevant. Um, all right. Anything else? Happy Halloween.